We're joined next by uh, Jessica Malugin, who is the director of the Center for Technology and Innovation at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. With us this morning, we're going to talk about the upcoming subcommittee to investigate uh, tech, tech company practices, the House uh, uh, Committee on Weaponization of the federal government formed this past week in legislation passed by the, the House. The headline from the CNBC, the House to investigate whether the White House pressured tech companies to suppress conservatives. Was that the underlying reason for the House creating this committee? I think that's the main thrust. I think we also have the Twitter files and Elon Musk to thank for bringing all of this out into the open. Um, I think what they're going to find, though, it's going to be considerably less partisan than maybe some people are hoping for. I think you're going to see this sort of pressure being applied by both Democrats and Republicans while they were in office. It's, it does seem like that the big tech executives have not, uh, at times, not made real friends with both Republicans and Democrats. Well, they have a really difficult job. Uh, moderating content at that scale, billions of posts, and deciding what what is potentially dangerous, what's going to get them in trouble, what other viewers on the site want to be exposed to. Those are very difficult decisions, and some of them are automated, but the most controversial ones uh, kind of rise up to the surface, and a human being at these companies has to make those decisions. And they're, they're much more difficult calls. You know, it seems obvious to us, oh, well, that's bad, you don't want that, that's not true, you don't want that. But when it comes down to what's true and what's harmful or what's informative, what's controversial but needs to be challenging and said, these are very difficult decisions. So it doesn't surprise me that at some point they've angered both political parties in making them. Is it your sense that in the, in the long run we'll see changes in the way social media platforms uh, monitor content, uh, allow content on their sites? I think there's going to be some improvements on the technology side. I think that the more control you can put your users into, at the very least, that keeps the heat off your company from making these decisions. You know, I, I don't think when Mark Zuckerberg got into this, he was thinking about being the arbiter of truth and free speech in America. They, you know, they don't enjoy making these decisions, but they have a platform. They want to cultivate that experience. They have a brand to protect. They want what they want on there, and they don't want what they don't want on there. That's a little different, Twitter to Facebook to YouTube. YouTube. But those are really hard decisions. I think the more they can put the end users in charge of what they see with filters and, and other technologies coming along, um, that'll probably help t take some of the heat off of that. Well, well you mentioned the, the Twitter files. The files released after Elon Musk took over uh, uh, Twitter in terms of the, the engagement of the federal government with Twitter on issues of content. In particular, the reporting there of Matt, uh, Matt Taibbi detailing some of these. Um, what do you think will come out of that in terms of what the, the House, this House committee in particular, may do? Well, what they'll specifically do, we don't know yet. But I think it is a really important distinction we're starting to make here with, you know, up until we saw the Twitter files come out, we'd really been basing most of the anger at the companies themselves for this moderation. Yeah. And now we're getting kind of an interesting look into, well, where is that pressure coming from? It's easy enough to understand the motivation of most of these big tech companies. It's they want to keep their advertisers happy. That's how these companies make money. They don't want anything on there that upsets that. They want plenty of eyeballs on their platform. We kind of understand those decisions, even if we don't always agree with them. But when you see official government action pressuring these companies to make decisions that perhaps they wouldn't have otherwise, that's a very different thing. And then you get into a real conversation about, well, where is the line where free speech is being abridged here? What are, what, where is that line in social media? We don't have answers for that yet, because this is a relatively new phenomenon in technology. But I think, you know, the most optimistic thing I can say about that committee is maybe we can find some of those answers and how we're going to deal with keeping private decisions about content moderation separate from government decisions. Our guest, Jessica Malugin, is with the Competitive uh, Enterprise Institute. Welcome your calls and comments on this issue. 202-748-8000 is the line to call for Democrats. It's 202-748-8001 for Republicans and for independents and others, 202-748-8002. What do you do in particular at the Competitive Enterprise Institute in regard to the, the area of social media content, big tech? Yeah, in particular. Well, we're sort of a regulatory watchdog at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I work on that in terms of the tech issues. So that would be digital privacy, net neutrality legislation, 
um, these content moderation issues, and then, of course, um, the big push for antitrust against these companies, too. Have you testified on Capitol Hill before? Do you anticipate testifying before some of the committees under the 118th? Well, I'm always available. They know where to find me. Um, but um, I have a feeling that they'll be probably more interested in the people running these companies, at least at first, and, and maybe even for real ratings getter, uh, Elon Musk might get called in. So we'll see. So the, the committee that was passed, the House passed a uh, uh, a resolution creating the committee on the weaponization of the a subcommittee, a select subcommittee, on the weaponization of the federal government. That committee would investigate the executive branch authority to investigate individuals, including criminal probes. It would investigate U.S. government and private companies collecting and sharing information of individuals. And that sounds like the one that's most closely resonates with the the recently released uh, Twitter files. I think that's right. So. The big picture on this is that the government asks private companies to do things all the time. It's ubiquitous and it's been happening since for, for decades. It's nothing new. And as long as the ask is an ask and it's not accompanied by a specific threat of retaliation if they refuse, then they're okay and they're staying on the right side of things. But if you get specific about what might happen if you don't agree, then now you've crossed into something that might really be a First Amendment violation. You know, the government is not allowed to ask private companies to do things for them under penalty of retaliation that that government itself wouldn't be able to do constitutionally. In, in the area of free speech in particular, and freedom of the press, I should say, de describe the differences between how uh, a platform like Twitter or like Facebook operates and uh, organizations such as uh, a, a newspaper, which may actually, actually have a very active on, online presence, the Wall Street Journal, Mm -hmm. uh, the New York Times. What is the difference editorial and uh, between those two organizations? So a news organization is responsible, has legal liability for what it publishes, right? If I write in a letter to the editor and then the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times decides to publish it, they are assumed some responsibility there for what they print. Now, that's not the truth true for their section, their comment section on their websites. They enjoy the same liability, the Section 230 liability protections that everyone does. They are not responsible for third-party comments when they're hosting those third-party comments. It's a little different than what's published in the newspaper proper. So that Section 230 liability is what platforms use every day. So Facebook is not responsible for what you or I post on Facebook. We're responsible for that content. And that's sort of the basis of what Section 230 says. It's not Facebook or Twitter or YouTube who's responsible for those third-party content posts, it's the people who wrote those third-party But there are posts. people who've argued that those organizations should be responsible and should not have that 230, that uh, Section 230 um, immunity under that, correct? Yes, very controversial Section 230. Republicans hate it because it lets these companies, what they say, take too much stuff down. Democrats hate it because they say, oh my gosh, they're leaving all this stuff up that otherwise we might be able to sue them for. So they're both angry about it, but they're angry about it for diametrically opposed reasons. Um, and if you didn't have Section 230, the big difference, uh, the Internet would look very different. For better or worse, what you wouldn't have is third-party content the way you do now. Like, what, are, what is social media? It's all of us talking. Everyone has a microphone now. Those platforms would not want to carry the legal liability for everyone speaking that they do now. Better or worse is a matter of opinion, but it would certainly be different. You're obviously a very active and engaged observer of social media, Twitter, t Twitter in particular. How do you think it has changed uh, under the new leadership of Elon Musk? What, what have you seen? <clears throat> well, I mean, I think everyone has a more of an individual experience on these platforms than maybe even they realize. They're getting things that are tailored to who they follow, what they engage with, what they look at. For me, I'm a very... Uh, conservative, boring user of Twitter. I use it for work, and I mostly follow people who I'm interested in hearing what they have to say about tech news as it happens. But I'm not a very aggressive poster myself of my own content. So I haven't really seen much, much change for me. I follow who I follow. Um, I stay in my lane. I, I'm, I'm a pretty boring user. But um, people have had, you know, some people say it's just a million times better. Some people say it's gone down the toilet. They don't want to have anything to do with it, and they're over on Mastodon. I think it kind of depends. Uh, what your priorities are on Twitter and what you're looking for. You've probably had a very different experience 